You're listening to a podcast from The Word. So here we are, uh, the 18th of July, the day after our much-anticipated Word in the Park, in Holland Park, our return to, much delayed return to, in-person appearances. After 18 months of being online, incredible, wasn't it? And we had gorgeous baking heat, there were enlivening drinks, there were people in shorts. I, I felt there was a competition to see who could wear the coolest the most faded rock t-shirt. I felt that oh, was okay. okay. Yeah, it was, it was an extraordinary place though, wasn't it? Because it was Fabulous. Opera Holland Park, which is, they have a, a covered auditorium, which normally seats 1500, but, but obviously because of social distancing, they had to redesign it this year. So, so it takes 400 or something like that. And, and so it's, it's individual seats, isn't it? You know, three here, two here, one there, one, you know, yeah. it, it's a really unusual An setup. An incredibly comfortable setup, actually. None of that sort of normal feeling of crush and, you know, yes. crowd that you get. I thought it was really lovely. Yeah, really people, were, people were so relaxed when they got yeah. there because it was such a gorgeous day and it's such a gorgeous place. They were in such a good mood at the start. So had, though we, you know, we, we're going to pat ourselves on the back. It went very well. It went really it? well. It went, I think people really enjoyed it. We enjoyed it. I think all the guests enjoyed it. And uh, I got a very good feeling about it. A lot of fun. So what we're going to do is we recorded all four of our turns from the afternoon and we'll put them out in four separate podcasts. And so this is the first one. And he, this young man came first because he had a radio a radio program to go and do. And also, we still regard him as a young man, don't we? The, we can't get away from this, can we? We do, and he still, he still looks young. He, he does. And, I mean, just just so kind of so boyish and so enthusiastic. He's fantastic, I think. It was lovely. So our first guest was, uh, you know, one of our personal favourites, Gary Crowley. Guy in the middle, Gary. And Gary, you're on first, actually, because you've uh, you've got a radio show later on, haven't you? I think so. You I have. Away for that. I have. Yeah. Um, I, I was saying to the boys a little bit earlier on. I've just got this sort of recurring nightmare. Um, so rewind and go back to the mid 80s and I was on Capital Radio doing a Sunday evening show and um, me and my manager at the time who's still a really good friend did the London to um, Brighton cycle ride on a day like today so far so good we had a real hoot doing it I was on the back he was doing most of the cycling we get to Brighton which was absolutely packed and um, one of the guys who worked at Island Records my boss was the uh, was the MD um, he got him to, um, to, to to drive me back to do the radio show and of course you know what happened next the, the, the traffic was absolutely appalling and I'm looking at the watch oh my god it's half six I'm on at seven it's quarter to seven so that's not going to happen today <laughs> but but you made sure, didn't you? I'm going to be an hour early, yeah. I've got to ask you a question. This is, uh, you know, it's a far more civilised uh, alternative to the rock festival. You know, this is a couple of hours Hensome, in a yeah. very salubrious place with, with toilets nicer than most yes. of the houses. That Still we working, in. yeah. yeah. Uh, and uh, I want to know, have, do you never strike me as a rock festival goer? No, and, and you're right assuming that. Um, you know... <laughs> I mean, first impressions have a lot to uh, to answer sometimes. And um, the guy who I mentioned a little bit earlier on, you know, lovely fella called Clive Banks, my third job in music was um, being his assistant. I went to work for him because he was the uh, the kind of coolest radio TV plugger. Um, this is like the uh, late 70s, early 80s. And um, he'd literally taken on the Kinks. And uh, the Kinks were playing the Reading Festival. Uh, this was 1981. And um, we went on the Sunday, the Kinks were headlining. And um, it was just, an, you know, all my nightmares at once really. Absolutely bucket it down, um, uh, you know, wading through the, 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 the Mark and Maya. Hello, Mark. Hi, Maya. And um, it, I just couldn't wait to get out of there. But the kinks were absolutely amazing. It was a very surreal bill as well. It was Wishbone Ash and the Enid. I mean, this is 1981. Well, These are my people. for some, for some. But um, yeah, I mean, it was, um, it, it was quite a, a surreal afternoon. But, but the kinks were absolutely fantastic. 
So we've got to ask you about the, the modern world fanzine, which you started in about what it was, 77, 70, uh, 78, whatever, and, uh, and interviewed about the Pistols and the Clash and the Jam, all sorts of people. Give us some idea of your impressions of, of those groups then. Well, and did you imagine that they would go on to uh, the level of success that they, that they did? Well, well when, when I think back to that time, Mark, I just think how easy it sort of seemed in, in a way really because um, the school that I went to um, was just tucked behind Edgware Road, Rutherford School, it's been renamed since and um, you know w w we had so many punk people sort of um, you know surrounding the school, Steve Jones and Paul Cook literally um, you know lived at the, uh, the, the, the end of the road that our school um, was on and I'll always remember this, I can remember coming out of the school once, once I found out that two sex pistols lived at the end of our road of course every time I went home after school I would always go via their flat and I'll always remember you know coming up and, and literally seeing this sort of stretch black limousine pulling up and all four sex pistols um, literally falling out and uh, I mean Which you know my wrong, eyes really doesn't it the it, sex pistols in a limousine <laughs> and drunk <laughs> as well and, and and you know my eyes were just apps I was like what the really oh my god and and um, I remember interviewing Paul Cook a couple of years ago and telling him about that day and um, because I never knew this and he said that that was the day that um, you know the limo had been ordered for them because they'd gone to Buckingham Palace to sign to uh, to a and records but um, yeah so so you know where, where the school w w was situated was just um, you know so um, you know we really were in the right place at, at the right time two pistols at the end of the road also literally past where they were was um, listen Grove um, doll clinic so you know you would see members of the slits um, and um, you know of other people sort of you know walking in and, and walking out and then you know the, my, my Probably my favourite memory is coming out of school one, you know, lunchtime and, and walking up to Edgware Road this time to get my, um, my, my regular, you know, bag of chips for 10p. And Joe Strummer was walking in the opposite direction and would literally just hijack the school magazine and, um, and, and, and turned it into a fanzine. And I just thought, well, I, I can't miss this opportunity. I said, Joe, my name's Gary. Um, you know, I, we've just started this fanzine. We're calling it The Modern World. The Jam I got a new song called The Modern World. He didn't know what had hit, had hit him. He just literally looked, you know, like that. And, um, but bless his cottons, he said, you know, he was like, calm down, calm down. What are you doing tomorrow? Why don't you and a pal... People have been saying, calm down, they calm have, down. They have, they have, and I haven't listened. <laughs> But no, so, so he said, listen, why don't a couple of you, you know, come along to the rehearsal studios tomorrow. Rehearsal rehearsals in Camden. Um, and um, I said, yeah, of course, yeah, two. Two will be fine, you know. And I got back to school and the word got out. And it kind of crept up to about six people. And we, um, we, we, we turned up dutifully at four o'clock the next day in Camden. Um, and... Um, I was always pushed to the front of, the, of, 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 of our crowd, and so I knocked on the door, and they had this road manager, a roadie called Roden, who was quite intimidating, and I remember him answering the door, and, um, you know, what the effing do you want, you know? My voice went up a couple of octaves. Well, I saw Joe yesterday, and he said it was okay if we come down, and, but anyway, Joe, you know, sort of turned up very, very quickly afterwards. In fact, they all did. It's funny, actually, when I think back to that time, because um, um, I, I, I made sure that, that uh, which I thought was sort of quite, um, uh, you know, ahead think, thinking in a way, really, to bring a camera. And um, so, you know, I said to the, to the band, you know, um, is it possible for me to have my picture taken? You know, so uh, I've got this great photo where the Clash of Five for one minute. But, yeah, but, but they were just, you know, and Joe in particular was just absolutely um, amazing. There was, you know, as I said, there were six of us there. So we interviewed him for about an hour and I've got the, the cassette somewhere. Um, if, you know, if you can imagine Neanderthal boy. Um, but he, um, you know, he was very, very patient. And then I remember there was a cafe that he liked to go to called uh, George's, which was just near Camden Bridge. And then he invited us all down to that afterwards. And it really meant a lot to me. I know it meant a lot to my pals as well. Um, but as I said, you know, it, it, it felt quite easy in a way, really. I think, you know, we were, you know, we loved the music. I think subconsciously, I think we were all waiting for, uh, for something like punk to, to happen. Um, I mean, I think I, you both know I'm a massive Beatles fan as well. But when I got into the Beatles when I was age 15 years of age, 
I was like, oh, well, I want something like this for me, you know, and I want a band like the Beatles and, you know, who kind of dress a little bit differently. And, um, and then, of course, you know, um, 1976, I started buying the music papers and then you started hearing about punk and, and the new wave. And, and, and the, the first band who really, um, you know, who, who really kind of resonated again, uh, you know, because of that Beatles influence was the jam, you know, because Mr. Weller would name check the Beatles as, as a, a big influence, um, you know, even though at that time it was no Elvis Beatles or the Rolling Stones. So they were my, um, they were my first band, but the Clash really ran them a very, very close second. You so know. your policy, your original, you know, encounter with Joe Strummer was meet him in the street, just speak to him. Is that a policy you've followed ever since with, uh, you know, have you, have you gone up to rock stars on the street and said, you never heard of me, I um, like you? Not really, but, but it, it's funny, you know, over this past year and enjoying um, the, the word in, in, in your attic interviews, I think, David, you might have said to, to somebody about those people that you kind of, for want of a better term, fall in love with when you're in your sort of mid-teens, you know, those ones are always right up there, I think. And, um, you know, whether it's been, you know, being lucky enough to, to, to have interviewed, you know, Paul McCartney a couple of times and Ringo, never got to do George. Um, we went to, um, the first time that I ever went to, um, to, to New York, I was incredibly lucky. I was, um, this was 1980, and um, we went, Pete Townsend paid for me to go to New York, because I was working for this guy, Clive, who I mentioned a little bit earlier on, and Clive did The Who and Elvis Costello and, and um, The Pretenders. So The Pretenders were playing the New York Palladium. I'd sorted out some skinheads for the Kenny Everett performance of Pete Townsend's Rough Boys um, um, track. And, um, you sorted, sorted out sort, some skinheads. Well, skin I, so I, I'm going to stop you there. <laughs> I, I had to go. So this is 1980. So I had to go to places like, you know, the Hammersmith Palais and hand out invitations to, um, you know, the toughest looking skinheads and say, listen, do you want to come to the Kenny Everett show? You know, because they're performing. Blah, blah. And it was packed. In fact, it's up there on YouTube. If you, um, if, if, if you, you know, freeze, freeze frames, frame it. I mean, I'm, I'm in there somewhere. And Pete, very, very generously, um, you know, paid for me to um, to go to New York to see the Pretenders, and then up to um, to Toronto to see the Who. And this was the first tour with Kenny Jones on on, on drums as well. So um, going right round the houses there. In answer to your question, um, I, I've always been a fan, and 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 you know, I think you know, right at the very very beginning, I was always interested in the process, in the people who produce the record sometimes and, um, you know, the PR people, um, the managers obviously, you know, Andrew Lou Goldham is a friend on Twitter, which still blows my mind. Um, so, uh, yeah, that, that's it basically. Thank you. Good night. <laughs> so, how, how do you... We thought we'd never get a word out of him, actually. I'm astonished. Sorry, carry on. Go on. Go on. No, I just thought we'd never get a word out of it. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I was worried that we wouldn't wink him out of his shell, but it's going all right so far. Um, how did you find your encounters with the Beatles? Well, uh, you know, the, 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 um, the day interviewing Paul McCartney for the first time was just the most... I mean, I could get emotional thinking about it, really. I mean, I cannot tell you you know, how special they were to me. I mean, I, I, I kind of got the Beatle bug through watching an episode of um, Tony Palmer's All You Need Is Love, and one program was completely dedicated to them, and um, if my memory serves me correctly, it opened with them performing Some Other Guy um, at the Cavern, and I was like, what the... I mean, I'd heard of them, but that episode just absolutely, you know, galvanised me. And then everything, it was all about the Beatles afterwards. And, um, you know, there wasn't a lot of money around the house, but um, I'd go to second-hand shops and, 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 you know, start buying records. And in fact, there was a, a group of kids in, in, in the secondary that, that I went to, about two or three of us who I knew were, were Beatles fans as well. So, you know, we would kind of sort of lend each other records, and, and, you know, sort of swap magazines and if there were any articles. I mean, a big thing was going to the, um, to, 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 to the library as well and, you know, getting out books like um, George Melly's Revolt into Style and, you know, Hunter Davis's, um, you know, um, biography on the band as well. And, um, you know, those were kind of like special trips. But 
interviewing you know Mr. McCartney th th that day. It, it was for the um, the Run Devil Run um, album, and um, you know we we did the interview at the uh, the offices in Soho, and um, I think we were told you know that we were going to get 20 minutes or something, and um, I mean as I said I'm a massive Beatles fan, and and you know know a lot of the story, but he seemed very very relaxed. That, that, that afternoon, bless him. In fact, he was going off to do later with Jules Holland. And um, he was telling me things. He was talking about, um, you know, Hamburg and, and, and Liverpool, stuff that I hadn't read before. And um, I think we ended up getting 40, 40 minutes. And he had this lovely PR guy it's called Jeff It's such a great ruse, though, isn't it? You've only got 20 minutes, and then when you get more, you think, it's me! Well, <laughs> me, that's why, because he, he, he loves me. Well, well, me. well but, it's, so uh, funny, it's so funny you should say that, because on the way out, I floated out of the office, and Jeff Baker, who's a lovely, lovely guy, said, he liked you, you got 40. They, they and, say, uh, that, say that to the older boys. Did you boys. get it? Oh, no! Because <laughs> <laughs> the other, the other knack that McCartney's got, I don't know if you've noticed this, is he always says, I've met you before. Yeah. Right. Because he, he didn't clearly say that. has met everybody before, you yeah. know. So it's, yeah. a, it's a natural working assumption. That yes, he, he's met somebody before. Yes, and they, yeah, they remember it. I mean, I remember, um, you know, when I would have first met, you know, you, you two guys. You know, I mean, Mark used oh, well, to. That come would in. be bound to go so, to anybody's head. I, I, I used to be the receptionist. I mean, obviously, Danny's coming on a little bit later on, and I took two over. former receptionists from yes. the NME. Yeah, and um, Danny. Um, so, so Mark used to come into the um, in, in, into the enemy, and I've told him this before, but. But he was kind of, he had this sort of kind of young Paul McCartney sort of droopy eyes thing. I always kind of remember that. And David was at the um, uh, uh, Smash Hits. But you would go out to lunch and you would see every, you know, a couple of times you'd see Paul McCartney. But he'd be walking so quickly, you know. And I always sort of remember re reading a, an interview where he did that because, you know, he knew that if people you know, did the sort of second sort of look thing, you know, they'd be on him. So, um, so, so yeah, you would kind of sort of see him around. But, no, that was the first time. And uh, I think I was his favourite for about a year, you know, because, <laughs> because he, he, I remember actually, the, the, you know, I've, I've still got, and it's a cassette as well, he, he, he called in not long after 9-11 and because uh, he was on the tarmac. I mean, I'm sure Mark yeah, yeah, would, would, yeah. would, you know, would know about this, but he, he was telling us about, you know, being on, on, on the um, tarmac after the planes going into 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 in, in, into the buildings and um, and then I also um, did him for um, for, for, for an, an album an EPK and it, it, it's just the, the most surreal experience which I'm sure you two will get you know because every now and then this little voice it's fucking Paul McCartney Jesus you know it, 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 yeah. you want, you want so everybody it's, it's you always a, in your on, life on the outside you? on the outside you're relaxed you're sitting there <laughs> pretending you're pretending. having a casual conversation Inside, jumping up and down inside you is, that's Bob McCartney, and you're here. Uh, no. You know what I mean? There's two things yeah. going on in parallel there. Yeah. It's extraordinary. Yeah. So uh, you, 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 we were hoping to be able to sell your CD here today, yes. Gary. But yes. uh, unfortunately, it's not here. But no. Plug away your Someone's CD. Someone's backside will be... Yes, RT. you can imagine. The wrath yeah. of Gary Crowley is but something to be dreaded. <laughs> so this is a, a lost 80s CD, isn't Volume it? Volume 2. Volume yeah, 2. Yeah, the inspiringly titled. That's how much and of the 80s yeah. was lost. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, I found it. I found it. But it... it, it it's interesting. I think you know all of us. You know, we'll, we'll, we'll always have an affection for, for for the music of our sort of late teens, early twenties, and um, you know, I I was spoiled. I was given my own radio show when I was uh, you know 19 years of age in 1982 um, to play whatever I wanted to play, and um, you know, thankfully that has um, has been been the case the whole way through um, and long may it continue but the, but but you know the, 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 that, that part of the 80s because the, these two albums do focus on the first half of the 80s I do think that you know a lot of those music makers um, uh, 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 of that time you know, there's that wonderful influence of punk, you know, that DIY, have-a-go attitude. But, you know, it, it was still about the song, you know, and I think the influence of, you know, all those great songwriters, um, artists of the 60s and the 70s, 
permeates, I think, on a lot of those, um, th th those bands, those artists, those songs, because um, they were either direct influences or they were trying to ape them in some way. So, um, yeah. So you were at the WAG Club as a DJ for a while and did a lot of suburban DJing as well. And there, you were, you know, Wham and Spanda Ballet, Banana Rama. Was there any kind of underrated act from the 80s that you thought deserved a little bit more attention and success than they got? Oh, God, that, that's a good... Um, that's a good... I mean... I, always, I was a massive Haircut 100 fan. I remember you know, vividly seeing them for the first time um, at the Embassy Club in um, 1981. And again, that was a, you know, 8081 was a very interesting year, I think, because you know, it was beginning to change a little bit. It was about the dance floor. And, and, and I always remember going to see Haircut at, at the Embassy Club and there was you know, literally a handful of people in there and thinking, wow, it's going somewhere different now. Um, it was about dancing again. They seem so 80s now, don't they? The, the, the mental image but of Nick great Hayward songs, with a kind of pastel, songs. pastel jumper. Oh, uh, great songs. Great over his shoulders. Oh, fantastic songs. Great <laughs> songs. I'll say it once more. Great songs. And, and uh, you know, I, I always sort of think with, with Haircut, what the second album might have um, might have sound sounded like, but um, you know they unfortunately um, imploded. But in answer to your question, Mark, around that time we sadly lost Bob Sargent, the producer, um, this week, who, who's you know produced a couple of my favourite albums, the first Beat album and the first Haircut 100 album, and um, he also produced another band called Friends Again. Do you remember Friends again? They were from um, Glasgow, and yeah. you know Glasgow in the early '80s was this sort of you know hotbed of, of musical activity. And Bob produced them. They were signed to Mercury um, Phonogram, and uh, you know, like a lot of those bands in Glasgow at the time, there was a there was a dance influence, but you know there was a bit of the Birds and the Velvets going on. There were this real sort of mishmash of um, of influences. Um, and sadly, again, like Haircut, they kind of imploded uh, straight after that first album. Uh, anyone, any fans of um, Friends Again out there? I mean, just, they should have been enormous. You know, Honey at the Core, Sunkissed, um, you know, well, South for, of Love. 40 years later, 40 years later, here we are talking about Well, them. if you get two minutes in your, you know, maybe this evening, I don't think you'd, you'd, you'd be disappointed. And, and just, uh, can I just plug another band who I thought, you know, only made the one album and should have been absolutely enormous. It's one of my favourite albums. Um, a band called um, Cashier Number no. 9 who made a great album um, for Simon Raymond's Bella Union. Um, what was the bloody title of it now? It's gone. But again, if you get two minutes, it's, you know, it's just great songs. You know, they're like the sort of bastard sons of the Stone Roses or something. So, so these are represented on your, your new we're not, CD? No, we're, no, Friends Again were on the first compilation. Right, okay. The new one is, is, is you know, more of the same, um, you know, maybe kind of sort of tapping into the sort of soulful, kind of jazzier influence of 83, 84, right. you know, um, Working Week, Style Council, so Swing Out Sister. So that's out next Friday. Out next Friday. Finish with a plug. What a professional. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Gary Crowley. Thank you. This podcast is brought to you by The Word.